great for turf business to be back on our travels. We're here in Italy at uh, the home of Udinese, the Dacia Arena. Uh, and I'm going to catch up with Oliver Gris Hewitt, who is the head groundsman here, uh, has been here now for seven months. Oli, great to be here with you. We're sat in the stand at the Dacia Arena. Um, it's all calm and, and quiet. Um, has your you know, tenure here been all calm and quiet since you got here? It's been eventful, I can say that. Yeah. It's been difficult, challenging, uh, very like, rewarding at times. The challenge, I wasn't really sure what I was coming to. I had an idea in my mind, but it's definitely been harder than I expected, but thoroughly enjoyed it. So you've been here seven months now, I think. Yeah, great. Okay. So prior to that, you were up at St George's Park. Yes. What was brought you here then? I've always wanted to be a head groundsman. Um, I carried out my degree in sports, turf science and management. That put me in quite a bit of debt. Okay. So to pay that debt off, you need quite a good job. I've always wanted... It's for the last 10 years I've been striving to be ahead. I'll have went anywhere that will get me on that path. I've tried to learn off as many different people as I can to get here. I think I was in my last year at St George's, I was ready for a new challenge. In this industry, they don't come along often and there is a, an awful lot of people fighting for those jobs, a lot of good people. It just worked that I had a bit of a relationship with Scott, having been offered a job with Scott previously. I text him just casually to just say well done with his groundsman of the year award for the championship yeah. and he just sort of replied he's still after a job um, and then I, I was really busy at the time and he just said I might have a head job in Italy if you're interested and like, I, I was a bit like and I didn't I tried not to jump around a little bit but um, yeah it's I didn't want to message him back too quickly I wanted to think about it obviously there's a lot involved with your family moving out uh, I didn't know he was going to offer me the job either but when, when we got into talking, I realised this is what I've always wanted. I've always wanted this challenge. If you said to me 10 years ago when I started in the industry, you could be a head groundsman in a top league abroad, I'd have snapped your hand off. So regardless of anything, I had to give up what I was doing and give it a go, test myself and prove to people what I've been saying, that I can do it and come out and actually do it. So the setup here, as I understand it, is you're the only kind of full-time permanent member of the grounds team at the stadium but you're supported by kind of like a rotation yes. of other people coming over from, from Watford. But at best, there's only ever two of you, is that right? Yeah, that's great. There's only two of us at any time. It's So with the visa situation, Watford staff members can only work abroad for 90 days and then they have to go back. Obviously as well, Scott needs to be able, it depends on who wants to come over, who's able to, who has families and things like this. So with on my third member of staff that's come over now, which is currently changing back to the very first member of staff that I had. It makes trying to have time off, match days, everything becomes such a challenge. Um, Weather-wise, conditions, if you're trying to get a lot of work done, you've only got the two, of, you can only feasibly do what two of you can do. You can stretch the day out as long as possible, but it means a lot of long hours, very few days off, um, and a lot of hard work. But it's rewarding and I think for the lads that come over from Watford it's a chance for them not necessarily to be a deputy at a stadium but it's the chance to work alongside someone which I imagine with Scott himself some of these staff members don't at Watford so for them I think they're getting to learn a lot more when they come out here so it, it helps Scott, Scott's helping me. I think it's I could definitely do with more of them but it, it is what it is, we, we're doing well with what we have and I think at the end of the season we can then sort of say look we've done this with absolute minimum compared to what you would have in England. Yeah. Um, match day staff, we sort of started, we were getting two staff a game, but bear in mind these aren't actually, they're not green keepers, they're not groundsmen. One minute we'll see them being a cleaner or a steward yeah. and then they'll be out on the pitch. We'll have to try and train them to do the things that we're doing. The next game, it'll be somebody different. So then you feel like you, it's how much time do I put into this person to try and make them to be skilled at the job we're doing and know what we're doing. But then I'm also, I'm not doing my job whilst I'm teaching them. And then if they don't come back again, it was a bit all of a waste of time and I could have done more myself. So I've really struggled with that. Um, I, I did not know what to expect. I was thinking we would have more match day staff than we do, which two, again, is two's not very many if they know what they're doing. Never mind having to try and teach them during a match. We had one guy when um, we played Juventus. And it, I swear he just wanted to play the second half for Juve. We, we, we could not get him off the pitch. I was screaming and shouting, like, it's time to get off. And he was just stood at the middle of the pitch. Camera out. Uh, oh, we've had them, we've had them taking like, 
selfies with a player. The that Juve game was when Ronaldo was still at Juve. Right. So one of the guys to come and help us after the game, he's like he came over to me and I was telling him what to do and he went, Yeah, but where's Ronaldo? And I was like, Ronaldo's got nothing to do with it, mate. He's getting changed <laughs> in the changing room. This is what you need to do. Yeah. Told him what to do again. I turned round, he'd ran in towards the changing rooms. So I spoke to one of the Italian people and was like, the second you see him come back, send him on. I'm not having anything to do with this. <laughs> but it's, it's a challenge, it is a challenge. So, staffing levels aside, yeah. you've come here from England where, as an industry, we feel that the grounds management role is underappreciated in terms of its skill level by the general public and indeed some people that you're working for. Where does Italy stand on that? Is it ahead, equal or further behind? It's much further behind. I, it's really over here. I don't think it's classed as much of a profession at all. A lot of the clubs are contractors. I think the majority are. We're one of the only ones that are actually now an in-house sort of thing. So at a lot of these places, you would have the contractors would come and do the job. They may only be here two days a week. So the rest of the time, anyone else in the stadium can do whatever they really like on the pitch. So trying to change the culture that way, that has been a challenge, getting the all the staff members on board. They they do respect what we do. They've seen such a change in the actual pitch itself, but I think it's never going to be changed overnight, anything like this. It's just prolonged, keep going at it, and if, if something's going one way, you need to speak to the right person, get it changed. Um, I'm hoping that us being out here, we can change what it is over here, make it a proper profession and something that people look at in that manner, as opposed to a, it's just the contractor or it's an underskilled job, anyone can do this job. Like I was previously saying about the match day staff that we get given, I've tried to put it across to some of the people higher up at the club. Like, you're giving in these people who have no experience. You wouldn't let them go and be the... If the scout was off for a week, you wouldn't say, oh, go and be a scout. If the financial manager's off for a week, you wouldn't say, you run the finances. Yeah. He's not a groundsman. I, I, I can get what I can from them, but... I think we need to get to a point where we've looked into getting people from the college, which is quite close by, who do more of an agricultural based thing as a college. But for me, the main thing is I'm happy to teach anyone to do this job and get the people to where they need to be. But they need to want to do it, I think is a massive part of it. If they want to do it and want to learn, um, we can make a very professional team over here. But having the people who come and help us who aren't actually professional, I think also can drag us down in a way. I think it's long been recognised or viewed at home that British grounds care is probably the best in the world yeah. you look at some of the names that have been poached out of you know top jobs in in England to go and work in Spain and mm -hmm. uh, Paris etc a um, little bit of a different situation here because the owners uh, the family owns Watford mm -hmm. and Udinese here um, but do you think that was part of the the plan that they want somebody that has got that kind of British experience? I, th I think that it was always going to have to be um, an English groundsman just due to the fact of the relationship with Watford. I think Scott would also have a much more trust. He can, he doesn't speak Italian, so if it was someone Italian trying to get the right things across, I think he needed someone that he could trust over here and so did the Watford club themselves. The plan was always that we'd do the very first year on a minimal sort of budget, minimal staff, and try and get it across to Udinese what we can do if you just give us a little bit of help we can get even further and you've you've come from a culture that probably has a bit of investment yeah appreciates within the club what you're doing let's just talk about the, the, the difference in culture work-wise and doing the job here um, have you had the support that you think you need from the club over here in Italy so with it being here, I, I have a lot of relationships with the people higher up in the club, the director of football, the director of the actual club. So I have a, a, a direct contact when things aren't going my way and I want to try and get things working. But also it's a culture change for them. I don't think they've ever had someone in a groundsman role sort of telling them maybe what to do. Yeah. So for them, that it is a bit foreign. I think I've struggled a bit with, in Italy, it feels like a bit like you have a conversation about your next conversation about your next conversation <laughs> before you actually act. 
um, which I've sort of struggled with a little bit, but it's just slow and steady. You just have to keep going and going and going and say, look, we need this, we need this, this, this isn't right, can we change this? One of the first things was I needed to then, I wanted to get an email so that weekly I could send out, look, this is happening on the pitch, please could you stay off the pitch? If I could have fertilised, I could have done this, it would affect it if you were to go and do what you wanted. If you need to do photography, you need to do this, please just ask me first. We're, we're still dealing with that now, we're, um, but we were a lot closer than when I got here, which was just mayhem. The pitch was just like a break tea room for everyone at the everyone at the club. Oh, it's I, a nice open space, come yeah. and have a cigarette and a wander around. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> but for a groundsman, it's just an absolute nightmare, yeah. especially minimal staffed. If, with, as we've said, there's two of us here. If someone's in the shed, if someone's actually got a date, there's one person to try and stop a stream of people coming out. Yeah. It's a change in the culture. We're, we're getting close, and I'd like to believe in another year uh, I'll be pretty much what we're like in England. It's just slow, steady, keep ticking along. When Try not to lose my rag too much when people don't listen because I, I just have to understand that for the last however many years they've been at this club, this is just so foreign to them. And because I think as well groundsmanship's not thought of such a profession, there's, at first it's just a bit like, why would I listen to you? You're just a groundsman. Like, you just like, got to cut it and water it sometimes. Which, it? <laughs> which in the past I think was all that was really done here. Um, to them it's like when I said I was staying at Christmas, I need access on Christmas Day. I came in, there was like no water on, no nothing in the whole stadium. Like They were just thinking like, why? I was, I was wise, I'm supposed to put down that I'm only meant to work 40 hours a week, so I have to sort of bend the rules a little bit. Um, I think after the first uh, maybe month, the people higher up at the club noticed how much I was actually putting into this. And then they realised, it's, it's showing on the pitch, he's clearly doing everything he can. And they started, that respect just started to build and build and build slowly to a point now where the people do listen. I, I have to keep going, but I'll get there. I'll get there. We witnessed you a moment ago just intercepting somebody um, who looked like they were going to walk on your, your pitch, which... I say, I have to say, he's looking remarkably good. Like all groundsmen that I've ever met, you're not happy with it, but that's, that's mm. another story. Um, but you've had some challenges, and we'll come on to that. I'd like you to just, you know, share with us, you know, the time that you you kind of were here. I think was it 125th anniversary game, yeah. and you had a bit of a, a crisis with people trying to get on the pitch. Tell us about that. So I, this was I maybe had 15 minutes warning on this on the prep for an AC Milan game, which is one of the biggest games. For, like, if you're an English groundsman, you want to be working them sort of games. Yeah. Um, we're trying to prep. There is only two of us. I got, oh, there's going to be some kids coming in the ground. And I was like, oh, how many? And he said, 700. I was, <laughs> I was thinking, is, it, is this lost in translation? He must mean 70 or seven. <laughs> and no, as we started to like turn, there was just 700 kids <laughs> streaming around the corner. They brought out some of the women who work in the boxes to try and make a barrier to stop these kids. Yeah. But then me and Jono, who was here at the time, literally just had had to create our own barrier, trying to keep the kids back. Like the, it was it was carnage. I just have never known anything like this in my life. Um, at the same time, I'm trying to prep yeah. for a match. It, 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 yeah. Two versus seven hundred. Did you lose? Yeah, we drew. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's one of the challenges with kind of not understanding necessarily what the job involves. Yeah different culture different climate yeah i think is it a very different proposition trying to you know grow that pitch over here to compare to england yes and no there's the times of the year where it is very similar like climate wise to england summer wise i mean you can hit 40 degrees which i'm from cumbria i don't think it's ever since 40 <laughs> degrees ever um so that summer wise it, it is hard disease pressure is really high trying to grow the pitch in is just a nightmare because you've obviously you're having to do so much irrigation which then is just putting your disease pressure even more th through the roof which it was a challenge when I arrived the pitch wasn't where I was expecting it to be after how many weeks of growing had been there'd been disease twice before I got here during the growing we'd had disease a couple more times I mean in England we'll get the odd bit of disease but it just wasn't like this and then in the winter, we can drop down to minus 10, which, again, you'd think I'd get that in Cumbria near Scotland, but you don't. Like, it's nowhere near that. Um, so there's just times where we can only work on half the pitch, um, just due to the shade, the sun. It's We don't have the temperatures. And as an English groundsman, you just want to keep working, working. We're understaffed. We need to do what we, yeah. we can. And 
you, you stood just looking like, well, the, the, like the phrase is watching paint dry. We're literally trying to watch frost melt, and we're oh. just wanting to to work. So in them conditions, we've it's it's a struggle. We I think for just now we've just about finished our aeration, which we started two weeks ago. Which in England it will take you a day, but due to frost, this is it's just taken so long. Um, but you just have to keep working. You have you got to complete what you're doing. You can't let it get to you too much. Um, and you've got to just try and achieve the best that you can. It's a struggle. Uh, I'm quite glad that we're getting closer to spring. I think this will be ideal for us. We won't be in the 40s. We'll be more 20 region. We'll be getting full sunlight. So I think the second half of the season, we'll, we should do a really good job. That disease problem, is it meaning you're relying on more interventions and inputs than perhaps you would want to if you could utilise you know, some of the other things that you would be doing, like aeration, uh, I think one of your problems is you're not allowed to put the, the undersoil heating on. Yeah, The heating would have been a massive one for us this winter. Um, it's just been a process. It's something over here that we're still talking about getting the system switched on. The cost of fuel over here is double what you'll have in England. Again, with the culture here, they, they would only use it a day before a match, put it screaming all the way up as high as it'll go just to try and get the game on which was then really inefficient cost-wise. So we've been having to build an argument of, look, we'll, we'll run it, we'll run it at a much lower temperature, but it, you won't be spending the money you're spending just trying to crank it all the way up and all the way back down. So I'd like to think by next season we've got that argument in place and we can do that. Um, Tools-wise, some of the other things, like we don't, we've been trying to get some dew brushes, which in England is the most common. You, you'll find that all the way down to whatever level of football people will have a dew brush. It just wasn't even the thing over here. I All think right. they do a lot of tractor-mounted brushes, but it's, I don't want to be going up and down with a tractor. So now we're still, after seven months, we're about two weeks off finally getting a dew brush, which I think <laughs> when the growing time and things like that, when it really would help because we, we can use a rope, we can use a hose, um, but it, yeah, it, it's just, they're the standard things in England that you just don't even think about. Um, but, so, but dew brushes aside, are you getting all the kit and the products you need out here or are you having to bring it over? We're getting a lot of the kit we need out here. The problem we have is if anything is imported, there's quite a high importation tax. The machinery that we'd, you'd buy in England is also a lot more expensive over here. It's not as common. Um, obviously, grounds teams, there's a lot of people would use still using ride-ons at stadiums when I look at the pitches. You can get the kit. It's very expensive. But then again, we're also trying to because it's been done by contractors so much in the past, contractors would have all their own equipment. So then even just simple equipment, we're having to build a case to the club as to why we actually need it and yeah. what, what it does, what benefits it will give us. But all the time I'm trying to push all these things forward, the two of us, so I have to, yeah. I can't, it's where do I place my time? I need to be on the pitch, but then I need to be pushing these things further ahead. Managing upwards and managing your surface. But I'm just sitting in there, I can see a Dennis mower down there uh, and... Is that a verti drain on the back of that? Yeah, it is, yeah. So we've actually, we've got a Toro Procore on order, okay. um, but over here it's taken, it was on order from before I even arrived, so I've been here seven months and it still hasn't right, come okay. here yet. Um, the, we can get we can get the equipment. Um, we're, we're slowly getting to where we need to be. And, and what's the choice like in terms of, you know, fertiliser and, and other inputs that you might do? chemicals for interventions so they're quite expensive over here compared to what you would have in england i think a lot of the again everything's agricultural based over here so i, I haven't been to a lot of these places i would imagine there's quite a lot of agricultural fertilizers used the cost of it is is very expensive i mean i, I know prices are going up back home but the, for the order that i've placed in january seed has gone up over here 50 percent. a lot of the granular feeds have gone up 25 percent but Look, they were already 25% higher over here than they were right. in England anyway. Trying to get this across to people at the club, why you need these things, what benefit we'll have from them. It's I've also got to build that argument and the case. I just would like to think that after this first year, they see where, where we're at, what we've achieved, and they maybe loosen up those purse strings a little bit more. <laughs> That's becoming a common theme. I mean, you know, do you think you're achieving so far what you wanted to achieve? I think I've achieved everything I can with what I've got if that's a good way of saying it. Um, I don't know, I didn't know what I was coming to, so you don't know what, I always set my bar as high as it possibly can be, which I think some nights I'll go home here and I'll be just a bit stressed, a bit down, like, oh, it's not where I wanted it to be, I'm putting all this effort in and we're not getting there. But then that's turf, that, that's anywhere. Uh, I can only work with the amount of people I've got, the staff I've got, the fertilizers, the equipment. 
So you've got to do the best job with what you've got. I mean, I've always thought that in groundsmanship, it's very much, you can have everything. You should be more so rated on what you've done with what you've got as opposed to anything else because you, you can't work with machines you haven't got. I can't yeah. do things with stuff I don't have. So I think we're very close to achieving as much as we possibly can. And you get the investment, you take it to the to the next level. Um, so overall, with, with your experience out here, we, we'll talk a little bit about away from the ground now. Um, you're out here pretty much on, on your own other than your colleagues that come out from Watford. How have you found that? I get asked that quite a bit like by family and things, but it's like I haven't, I'm at work all the time, oh, so right. it's like not that much different. I mean, I go home, think about work, come to work, work, go home, plan, start planning the next day, maybe have a conversation with Scott, look, this is where we're at, we could do with this, with this. It's just work, 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 and I think that's what keeps me in a good mental space, keeps me going. Like, uh, I think if the, too much downtime for me is not a good thing. I just like going, 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 going. I've really, I do like the parts of the culture over here, but a lot of the culture over here is having a three-hour dinner break and a glass of wine in the morning, which I can't really do. I'm too busy. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I think we'll gloss over that one. Um, you're not feeling isolated out here, then? You, you have your day. You have, you'll have a day or so. But not really, like, I've got someone, I think that what's helping as well is the Watford staff member obviously speaks English, so I can have a decent conversation with someone. I'll often, if something does get to me, Scott will hear one end of it, and I'll just feel, I'll rant, 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 rant. See you later, Scott, bye. So you download. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I need to just get it off my chest, but then it's like, wake up the next day, let's go. What what have we got to do to make it the next level, the next level? Try harder. You seem a pretty positive guy. I mean, um, you were telling me earlier that, you know, you're trying to learn the language and it's getting better mm-hmm. but I think you got a, a, a bit of a lucky break when one manager was sacked replaced by you know the number two who's got great English and you've got a good relationship with it well it helps doesn't it yeah. I think I, I'm not then challenging with the actual playing staff as well I, I've got a direct link straight to the club like I can talk through the warm-ups I can talk anything that they're going to be doing I mean they try and play a lot of friendlies over here so before at the stadium which is isn't very common in England so once I sort of catch wind or there might be a friendly I can go and speak to him and say look this is where we're at this and he listens and um, the coaching staff I think have been very good over here they've at first they again they weren't treating us very much like professionals two months in once they seen the pitch they were playing on they um, they'll just re- they respect everything that I'm pretty much saying three months in they were coming back and been like this is the best pitch we've played on so far all all year round and to me that's that's what you want you want people who are actually using like using the pitch telling you that it's that good um, no it's good so they're, they're buying into what you're doing which is obviously good news um, do you see you here, yourself here for a while yeah I do um, if we can keep getting investing keep growing I'd like to start doing a bit more around at the training ground as time goes on when we get more stuff when we get more equipment um, it's Udine itself it's a lovely place to be uh, everyone's really welcoming um, I do like the lifestyle of it when I get the odd day off here and there when family have come over um, I really enjoy the place um, I'm from Cumbria I can't carry out my dreams in Cumbria it just isn't for, like the size of football club that can actually employ you so I'll go wherever the job takes me but I, I would like to stay here yeah what's been the biggest surprise then just the culture the, all around it, it is just the culture I I know that how much they love their football. Um, I didn't realise how much they don't love their football pitches until I started watching <laughs> a bit more Italian football and just seeing how things were done. Obviously over here as well, there's a lot of the clubs play at one stadium for two teams, yeah. which it's just a nightmare. I mean, I think I've got it bad sometimes. And then I was looking, it was roughly like the San Siro had had something ridiculous, like 12 games in 20 days or something, which... I, I've still got 12 days until my next game <laughs> and then sometimes I think I've got it bad but it's, it's just that culture of it and um, it's something that I'd like to sort of change how people think of groundsmen over here and I think that's what's such a good challenge and that's why I would stay over here because um, it's such a it's, it's great to try and do that somewhere and like be one of the first English groundsmen in this country to push for that yeah and so far seven months in mm-hmm. so it's probably a relatively short period of time but what's what's your highlight your moment that you you kind of feel is is the best moment for you here I've got to say like it's a personal one um, it was the Juventus game was the very first Serie A game of the season 
my granddad who's died now, he used to buy me Del Piero shirts. Every time he'd go on holiday, he'd come back with a Del Piero shirt. And like, I remember telling him like, look, I will be a head groundsman one day. And this was like eight years ago. I barely started in the industry and he believed in me. And then like to come out and like have Ronaldo, Benucci, you've got all these players on your pitch. And for my first day as a head groundsman, it was everything, all the times I've moved from home, doing my degree, every time I've pushed, it was just like, it, it just made it feel like I've done what I was set out. And then the next day I was like, right, what's the next goal? What's, what's the next one? On. Has it been a low point? Oh, there's been, there's been not, a, not a set like, oh, this was the worst point. You, in this, you'll always have points. Like, you think you get into a good place, you'll get disease. Or I think I'll get into a good place, oh, we want to train on the pitch. And it's like, oh, God. The, you, there is low points. Um, but that's what we're working with something that lives. You can turn the next day around and then you feel like you've achieved something else again. And for you know, the longer term view, you know, I ask you if you want to stay here. If, you know, uh, a job at a big club back in England came up is is that the ultimate ambition for you or is it you open minded very much open minded I think there's there's so many job, good jobs in England but there's so many good groundsmen in England that go for these jobs once people are in them people can stay in them for 30 40 years so it's so rare that these jobs come up I don't really have a I'd like to obviously I'm just ahead at a stadium at the minute the next one's to become a grounds manager manage both um We've just got to see where I go. Like, I'm not tying myself down to anywhere, but we'll, see, we'll just see what happens here. So that'd be a nice progression if you do get the, the training facilities as well. And I think um, certainly some of the plans we've been, been talking off camera, it sounds like that could come to fruition. Mm -hmm. At some point, your time here will end, yeah? Whether that's five months, five years, 50 years, whatever, yeah? What would you like to leave behind as your kind of legacy for want of a better word at Udinese specifically yeah um, I would more like to put that as, to a like a Syria like a Syria sort of thing like I would just like to if I could change the way groundsmen are thought of in this country make it so that people watch and look what we've done here and try and do that at their own clubs instead of contractors have people here who actually care about this pitch like nothing else um, I would like people to just be like he went over there and he's managed to change the mentality of how groundsmanship is thought of. I think that's an appropriate place to stop that one. Yeah. Thanks, Ollie. It's been fascinating talking to you, and it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for coming. Good